was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not bleed. believe. Thomas, who many call Doubting Thomas, heard about the resurrection, but he is not sure. He wants to see. He wants to touch. He wants to know for a fact. And I have to be honest with you, who can really blame him? I mean, if you think about it, Jesus raised people from the dead. But he knows Jesus is now dead. He knows he's gone. He knows he's in that tomb. And how many of us, have you ever gone to a funeral and you've been there, you've watched the body lowered into the ground, they cover it up, you walk away. How many of you expect to talk to that person eight days later? Not very common. Yeah, it is a done deal. When you're in the ground, it's over. That's where Thomas's mind is at. Okay. Yes, he's seen Jesus heal. He's seen Jesus raise the dead. But Jesus himself is gone now. It's different. Jesus didn't have to die, and I'm sure Thomas knew that. But God had a better plan and a greater plan than the disciples and Thomas even knew. And I would like to look at a point, looking at the mon mindset of Thomas, since, you know, he can get criticism for doubting. Look at me at John eleven sixteen. You think about Thomas. It says, Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go that we may die with him. Jesus announces his intention to travel back to Bethany, close to Jerusalem. His friend Lazarus is sick. He's been told. Jesus knows Lazarus has died. He is going back now to raise him. But Thomas and the other disciples know Jesus is hated. The Jewish leaders want him dead. They want him removed. So when Jesus says, from the relative safety of Galilee, when he says, hey, I want to go back, Thomas is going, well, okay, guys. Let's say we go back and we die with him because we're not letting him go alone. That's the inference there. He's not going alone. We're going with him. So we'll go, and we'll follow, and we'll be faithful, and we'll die with him. Now, turn back to John 20, because we're going to look at 26 through 31, the end of this chapter here. Twenty-six begins, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen, seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. 
Thomas sees and believes. His words, my Lord and my God. He calls Jesus this. Thomas is affirming his faith in the resurrected Jesus. J. Vernon McGee says, You will not find a higher testimony to the Lord Jesus than the one given by Thomas. It is one of the greatest confessions of Scripture for a Jew to say, My Lord and my God is the absolute climax. Now look at the response of Jesus to that profession. Thomas, you see, you believed. That's good. But then he goes on, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That's us. That's us right there. We see through faith. We don't have... I looking around, I don't think anybody's old enough in here to have been around when Jesus was around. Um, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> um, but <laughs> couldn't help that, sorry. Um, Jesus was long gone before we ever got here. And yet, we believe we know we are the blessed. They saw the risen Lord with their eyes. We trust by faith given us by God. We, three, we see through faith. We know what God is doing and we're going to get to more in that in just a moment here. The next section I would like us to look at is when they were having breakfast by the Sea of Galilee. Seven of the disciples had gone fishing. They had apparently a break or some sort of time when Jesus wasn't with them, when he was with somebody else. So they decide to go fishing. They're fishing on the Sea of Galilee and they don't catch anything. I mean, they're coming back. Their nets are empty. Jesus calls to them from the shore and says, hey, put your nets on the other side. This sounds familiar. This has happened before. And they wonder, is this the Messiah? Is this Jesus? They put their nets down. And it comes back with 153 fish. Okay, the difference between 0 and 153 is a lot when you're talking about fish. They bring it in. And Simon Peter, who is on the boat, he puts on his clothes, jumps in the water, and gets to shore first. He's going to be there with Jesus. He has met Jesus. He is still excited about the resurrection. Well, okay, who wouldn't be? But he is still excited about the resurrection. He gets to be with the Lord again. He comes in, helps them pull in the net. They cook some fish. Jesus already has bread ready. They have breakfast. Breakfast with the Lord. Sounds like a good time. Then Jesus takes time to speak specifically to Simon Peter. I'd like us to look at 21, 15 through 19. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now, before we go any farther here, there's conjecture. They, they wonder, was Jesus speaking about the other disciples? Was Jesus speaking about the fish? I think he's talking about people in general here. Do you love me more than these? 
He said to him, this is Peter's response, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Peter had denied Jesus three times. Jesus questions Peter three times. Peter is being restored. And Peter is being told, you have work to do. And there's a lot that is in here. Do you love me? The question of Jesus. And Peter is, of course, more than willing to respond, yes. But the response of Peter isn't the love of total dedication. Peter is telling Jesus, I love you like my best friend in the world. I love you like I love my wife. I love you better than almost anything. Jesus wants absolute commitment. And Peter is grieved. If anybody knew what these questions were hitting at, Peter knew. With no pressure at all, or hardly any pressure, Peter denied Jesus three times. He wasn't being put on a cross. He was being questioned at one point by a little servant girl. And he says, I do not know the man. Peter knew what love meant. And Peter knew what Jesus was asking. And he struggles with this. Peter knew what it felt like when as recorded in Luke 22.62, the rooster crowed the second time and Peter wept bitterly. He knew what it meant. He had failed. And I thought about this as I was putting this message together. I've failed several times. I wish I could say I was always strong always faithful, always just absolutely the perfect leader, the perfect pastor, the perfect husband and father. I haven't been. I have failed. But if I would share this with you, I think sometimes, maybe, every one of us have failed. God expects perfection we sometimes fall a little short. See, I, like you, suffer from living in a fallen world, a world with a lot of evil, a lot of sin in it. And yet through it all, when we have this old nature that wants to lean on sin, believers have a new nature that says we need to lean more on the Savior and trust more in the Savior. I told someone years ago that one of the qualifications for attending here is that you had to be a sinner. Well, I pretty much guaranteed everybody who ever walked through the door met the qualifications. Okay, I wasn't calling anybody that, but I'm pretty sure we met those qualifications. To my knowledge, physically, As we dwell on this earth, there are no perfect people in this auditorium. And if there are, don't let me know about it. 
because I will go too far to be your friend if you truly are perfect. <clears throat> now, as I say that, I do say that with the understanding that God sees all of his children perfect and holy. God sees us through the blood of his Son shed for us. And that means that in the sight of God, I am perfect and holy. I can stand up and say in the sight of God, I am righteous. Because I have the righteousness of his Son covering me. And so does every believer in this place and every believer around this world. We have the righteousness of God. I may struggle with sin, but my Father in heaven views me as perfect. Peter in this message is told three times to care for others. Jesus wants him aware that even with the sin in the life of Peter, he is still useful. And so are we. Even when we fall short of perfection, we are still useful to our God. Peter is forgiven. And if you were to continue reading in that chapter, you see that he is told that his responsibility is to the Lord. When he closes what we did read with the words, follow me, Peter doesn't want him, or Jesus doesn't want Peter concerned about what's going to happen to John or what's going to happen to the other disciples. Jesus wants Peter to focus on him first. That he is not to put other responsibilities before his responsibility to serve the Lord. Peter would ser serve the Lord for around 30 more years and would die for his faith. Tradition holds that he was martyred under Emperor Nero by being crucified. But tradition also holds, and I use the word tradition because it's not recorded in here, but tradition holds that he was crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to be crucified the same way his Lord was. I would like you to look at the end of John chapter 21 with me. We're going to look at verses 24 and 25. This is John giving us a little bit of who he is. This is this disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. John was with Jesus. He knew what he saw. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. A Amen. Chapter 20 closed. These were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. This closes with, He has done so much, you can't write it all down. We are given just a tiny little glimpse of what Jesus did when He was on earth for the 40 days after the resurrection. That's all we have is a little bit about what he did. We're given little bits and pieces about what he did when he was alive on this earth before the crucifixion. But you can't condense 30 years of service, 33 years, however you want to count it, into just a few books. There's a lot that Jesus did that we don't know about. Someday, maybe he'll tell us about it. Someday maybe we'll find out about the ones that he healed that nobody knew. John, like Peter, would serve the Lord the remainder of his life. But he would not be killed. He would die an old man. 
And I have a little passage here from Herbert Lockyer in his book, All the Apostles. And he closes out John with, We are certain of the fact that John outlived all the other apostles, that he was banished to Patmos because of his witness for Christ, that he spent his last years in Ephesus laboring to promote love among Christians, that he died during the reign of Trajan, which began in 98. So sometime after 98. Church history conformed, excuse me, church history confirms that he had as disciples in his old age three men who became famous in the early church, namely Polycarp, Pappus, and Ignatius, all of whom wrote affectionately of John and testified that he was loving, lowly, patient, and good to the end of his days. Wouldn't it be great if we had somebody who wrote that about us? You were lowly, good, patient, loving till the end of your days. Preaching love and good for the rest of our lives. The Apostle John outlived everyone else. John was a witness. He saw. He knew what Jesus did. He was the first of the apostles at the tomb after the resurrection. He looked in there and saw that big hole and went, ah, nobody's here. He witnessed the miracles of Jesus. He was the inner circle. He saw things. He saw Jesus in all of his glory before and after. He's one of the witnesses who watched him ascend to heaven and heard the words, Why stand ye gazing? That same Jesus will come back. John testified, and his testimony is still alive today. We're reading this book that he wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And he is testifying today of who Jesus is and how much he loved and how much he gave. The gospel is real and powerful. We are witnesses. We can't testify, I saw the risen Savior. But you know what? We can testify, I know the change that came into my heart the day I met the Lord. I know the difference that He has made in the lives of people around this world. We can testify that this book is real and alive and powerful. We too can be witnesses. We may have not seen with our eyes, but our minds and our hearts know what Jesus has done. We know He is alive. And we know He is coming back. The wonders of Jesus were so big and, his, and so numerous, and yet they are still being recorded today. God is still alive. His Spirit is still working, and Jesus will return. We need to be testifying with our changed lives to who Jesus is and what He has done. Because to everyone that knows Him, we know. We know who He is. I am perfect in the sight of my God. Every believer is perfect in the sight of our God because of what 
Jesus did. I trust that every one of us know him, that we have accepted the gift of salvation that he has provided, that we understand who he is and why he loves us. We're going to close singing song number 222. There is a fountain. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 5. 